Uh, can I start? Yeah, let's start. Uh, okay. Oh no, well, <laughs> waited just long enough for the laptop to work. All right. So, hi, everybody. For those who weren't here for the last five minutes of random rambling, um, <laughs> I'm Tobias from the GNOME Project. Um, I'm a designer there. And um, I'm not really going to talk about that in detail. I'm going to talk about a more specific topic, which is animation. And specifically, sort of the, the ramifications of adding animation to interfaces. Um, but before we get to that, let's briefly make the case for animation in interfaces. So I think especially among the more like technical maybe people in our community, I think there's, there's this notion that animation is like this really frivolous thing that you can do it, but it's like, well, it's so much work, and it doesn't really deliver any actual value, and you know, it, it, it's kind of eye candy. And it can be that, right? Uh, you can just like make your interface and then be like, oh, let's have it bloopity bloop somewhere. Um, and, and, and that is one way to treat it, but it's, I don't think it's a very useful way to think about it. Um, I think th the more sort of productive way to think about it is to just think about it as adding the dimension of time to your interface. So regular, like a regular interface is just a 2D surface, and then you like do some fake 3D sort of <laughs> depth with shadows. But if you add time, you have like a whole 60 frames per second between every sort of state that people see, where you can add more animation, uh, more information through animation that you use to tell people things, right? Um, and that, that is not really like something that is inherently um, functional or, or like just visual, but um, you just sort of see it as an additional way to, to, to communicate things to users. Um, and here's a very simple example from GNOME where um, this is uh, when you switch between two workspaces with no animation. Um, what you see here is just this hard cut. And then um, you kind of try to look around, like figure out what happened. And then you look at the little thumbnail, and you're like, oh, yeah, now I moved up to the other thing. Because so if you ha do all that matching yourself. <laughs> the same thing with an animation looks like this. So immediately, this, this animation tells you that there is a spatial model here. Things are above and below each other. And later, when you're like not even in the overview, you can just use the, the, the shortcut keys to go back up and down, because you learn this from the animation. Um, and this is one of many ways that you can use animation functionally. And, but that's not really what this talk is about. Um, what I, what I want to talk to you about is sort of if we do animation, um, first of all, what are the things that we want to avoid? And second of all, what follows from that? Um, so a couple of pitfalls that we're all familiar with. Um, you know, like animation is great, but most of the time, like somebody gets really enamored with an animation, they're like, oh, how about we make it three seconds and make the user wait? And this is a great example for macOS, where like if you add a workspace, there's this button that you, you click, and the thing moves all the way to the other side of the screen. And while it's doing that, you can't actually click the button again. So um, for, for these kinds of like, things that happen a lot in your interface, that, that pe people do a lot, it really doesn't make sense to have very slow animations, because people get it after a while. Whereas maybe if it's an animation that you only see once in onboarding, it's fine if it's a little slower. Um, but so yeah, generally, make your animations fast. Um, and then maybe a second common thing is like interfaces that go way overboard. And like, <laughs> the problem with animation is that, or like, one, one of the things about animation that, that you have to really consider is the fact that it's really good at grabbing your attention. But <laughs> if you overdo it, like, you're going to get crazy fast. So you need to like, make sure that um, you communicate the things that are important, and you don't overdo it with, with your animations. Because that does just like, distracts from the content. So these are kind of the obvious cases. Um, let's get to the more interesting ones. This is the iOS home screen up until iOS 11. Um, and this is the animation when you open an application. So what happens is you click the icon, it zooms in, like the whole home screen zooms in, and all the icons get bigger, right? The whole home screen is now huge, and <laughs> the icon has transformed into the app. And so this is great so far, right? We know now that we are inside this huge space, and like this is our app, right? 
Um, the problem is, if you go to multitasking, you get kind of an opposite animation, but now you're somewhere else. And all that stuff that it just told you, like those icons being around you, that's now not true anymore. And if you go all the way to the side, there's another home screen inside the home screen. <laughs> so you know, I'm, like, there, there are some inconsistencies there from a, from a spatial perspective, and things like don't really line up. Um, and I think this this example is is, um, is indicative of a way of thinking that we've had in interface design for ever, really, because. Um, up until very recently, like doing lots of animations was not really feasible from a <laughs> hardware perspective. And so um, it's fine if you're not doing any animations to just like design all your screens, right? And then think, well, maybe we'll add an animation here or there or something. Because at the end of the day, like if you just bloop, bloop, bloop between screens, there, there, you don't have to think about these kinds of things. Um, and so like this, this screen-based um, kind of way of designing sort of works like this. You, you design all your separate screens, right? There's like our home screen that's this grid of icons, and then we have the full screen um, application, and then the switcher is its own separate thing. And then at some point later, we think like, oh, how are we going to connect these two screens? And then how are we going to connect those two screens? But if you do that, you don't think about like how all those things exist inside one larger system. And that's, I think, how you get this, this inconsistency. I mean, I don't know how that example happened in practice. Like, I can only speculate. But um, I think um, if, if, you, if you do animate all your transitions, at the end of the day, you'll always have to contend with space. Because in the user's mind, they don't think about screens. They think about the stuff they see on the screens. And so um, as a user, I see a thing, and then I see another version of that thing. I expect them to like, just be the same thing, just transform. Um, I don't expect there to be multiple versions of stuff. Um, and sort of there's, there's a whole bunch of implications that, that come from this. And so I think we need a new way, way of approaching, um, like a new process for designing interfaces that takes this into account if we are going to do animation. Um, and um, this new approach is semantic animation. The, the difference with semantic animation compared to the process we've just seen is this. Instead of thinking about the screens as units first, you think about what's on the screens first. You think about semantic components that have a meaning and that have states. And so in this case, we have this app component that's like an icon uh, or an open app or a card. And those are the three states that we have. And then we have a bunch of transitions, right? Those five transitions are all the sort of transitions that we will have to handle. Um, and we think through that entire system. And then when we actually get to the physical sort of rectangles that are visible on, on the user's device, it's kind of obvious what the animations are going to be. Right? The icon is the same thing as the full screen app, so it just expands. The whole home screen doesn't have to zoom. That's not really necessary for this to work. And then when we go to the multitasking thing, it just gets a little bit smaller. Right? But it doesn't affect everything else, because that's just not necessary for, for this component to change its state. And interestingly, this is exactly what iOS 11 did. So um, now it, it's a little fast, but if you look on, on the part here, you can see that the home screen doesn't actually zoom. The home screen just like fades a little bit into the background, but it, it doesn't do anything crazy. And so um, on the multitask animation, what happens is it's still there. So we have not broken the promise of, like, like in the other example, we, we are sort of keeping that, all of that stuff behind the application around. And all that happens is our sort of application component changes its state. Um, and like, I really love this example because it's been like under all of our noses for the past five years. And they just recently fixed it, and I'm so happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, some examples. One very common pattern is this kind of interface that has like a list of things. And then each of those things, you can click it, and then you see a little more of it. right? So like, this is an email client, the, the default iOS email client. Um, and you see that the email and the sort of detail view of the email are totally separate, right? But for the user, that doesn't make a ton of sense because for them, the email is like a semantic idea, right? Like, this is my email. <laughs> so why would there be two of them? And why would there be like, I don't know, a totally separate thing over there on the side? And this is especially interesting in the context of this email application that does the ex ex exact same thing, like 
functionally, but it doesn't duplicate the object, right? See that? It actually comes from within the preview. Um, and, and this is the kind of, this is the kind of thing I mean. Um, now, there's a lot of examples of this, and um, sort of, I, I think you're getting the idea. You basically think of what all the states are that your components have, and you think of all the transitions, and then you will not have these contradicting situations because you've already thought of them. Um, so, but I also know what, what, what you're thinking sort of on a larger level, right? Because those of us here who are designers and developers look at this and they're like, shit dog, I cannot implement this. Um, because like, all, of our, all of our toolkits, all of our layout technologies are just fighting us on this left and right. Um, and so I would like, for the, for the second part of this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're going to do this. Um, and so um, I, I think it's important to, to keep in mind uh, in, in that regard that there are some things that maybe we will not be able to do for a couple of years, or maybe like even many years, because the technologies we need to catch up. But there are also a few things that we can do right now. And so like, if we sort of look at the, the timeline of, of that, I'd like to talk about a few points on that timeline. Like, um, first of all, what, what can we do today right, um, with the technology that we have? This is an example from, from GNOME. Um, th this is the GNOME to-do app in its version like, that came out last year, 3.26. And um, you can like, drag and drop these tasks. And when you click one, what happens is you get this like, panel coming from the side with the details. So when you want to edit the thing, like, you have to click it. And then there's like, a totally separate thing that shows you the details of the thing, <coughs> which is exactly the pattern we just talked about with the email. right? Um, and what we did in 3.28 is we did this instead. Um, you can click it, and from within that preview comes the actual detail stuff, which functionally the exact same thing, but um, like semantically it makes so much more sense. Uh, and this is something that we were able to do relatively easily because GDK already has this thing called I think GDK Revealer um, that that just does this thing. It like expands a thing, sort of like an accordion. Um, and there are things like this that you can do in a lot of in a lot of technologies where. Um, you, you have an idea of, of sort of how the components should behave. And maybe you can't get the perfect animations, but thinking through all of the component stuff, I think it's useful even if you maybe don't do any animation because you have like a clearer picture of, of, what's, of what's going on. Um, so that's the, that's the present. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, so over the past few years, I've built a bunch of pretty hacky prototypes um, trying to explore some of these ideas. Um, this one is, is one of the most interesting ones, I think. It's like I built it um, for a large touch table. It was like a university kind of research project um, where you would essentially like order food by dragging these plates towards you. So you could like, you know, drag, drag these towards you, and then you, um, the, the, the plates are sort of semantic components. So y you see like the, the <laughs> label, when it goes away, it like goes into the component and the, the like, detail view for it comes from behind the plate. And so I, I was exploring some of these ideas there. Um, and it looks, and also like the, there's this spatial navigation where you have like these, um, these categories on, on the horizontal axis and the, the sort of checkout flow on the vertical. Um, and it looks really simple, right? But the implementation is just a garbage fire. <laughs> Because like this is this is actually this super simple component actually has five different states. Because like when it's not spawned yet, it's it's invisible there in the middle, and then you sort of um, spawn it to the grid and it has the label, and then you start dragging it, and you need to get rid of the label, and then you order it, you need to change the constraints, it needs to, like be fixed to your viewport, and like there's the dialog, and um, doing all of that stuff. I mean, I built this in web technologies, but I'm not sure it would be any different in like most other stacks because. Most technologies just expect you to like, give them a bunch of XML files. Those are the states. And now click OK and go to that other XML file. Uh, and doing this kind of stuff just requires hacks on every level um, at the moment, and, which is why it's, it's not really feasible in real world product, products, I think, unless you have insane engineering resources. Um, this is a, a second prototype that explores a little bit of a different idea, where it's kind of like this. this um, chat email sort of 
thing um, that actually sort of goes directly from the preview to the full view um, without ever sort of having duplicate items or, or breaking, breaking spatial consistency. Uh, and you can actually like interactively kind of drag and drop the thing to, to expand and, and, and open it. Uh, I mean, like this is also a very small and hacky prototype. But this is, I think, the kind of thing that we should enable in, in layout technologies and, and sort of toolkits to, to make easier. Um, so yeah, that, that's a little bit about the future. Now, how do we get there? Um, and I think I've already alluded to this. We need tools that sort of just have this baked into them and um, that, that make this really easy. And the, th this will have to happen both on the design side and on sort of the toolkit development side. Um, a little bit about, like, from my experience, from my experience, what um, what would be what would be good to have on, on the development side. Um, in in the web ecosystem, there's a lot of like talk about React these days and sort of their whole, uh, you know, um, unidirectional data flow, and you have like this one hierarchy of components where like this component renders these subcomponents, and I think that really goes in the right direction. What they don't have, and or like what is much harder there is to like, have multiple states uh, and actually do animations between that stuff. But I think like, that, that ecosystem is co going, I think, in an interesting direction. So probably like, if we were thinking of like, the future API for awesome interfaces, that I think would be an, would be an interesting part of it. Um, then yeah, like the whole component idea, um, where each component is, is um, essentially a state machine. But not only that, like, each of those sort of state machines it's made up of smaller components that are also state machines. Uh, so like essentially, like you have your list that has like three states, and then the list is made up of list items that also have like two states each, or something like that. And I think like that, that is also an, an idea that, that goes in the right direction. But yeah, I mean, take all of this with a grain of salt. I'm like a designer and sometimes web developer. Um, and then the other thing that's also really hard to do right now is um, like actually sort of transitioning the properties without just manually putting lots of values, like hard-coded values all across your code, like just declaratively defining all your components, and then like, these are the properties in state A, these are the properties in state B, just automatically like tween them. Uh, and then yeah, for interactive animations, um, super, super hard to do right now, I think, in almost everything. Because what you, and that even goes kind of against like the component idea in a way, because then you, if you want to do that declaratively, like you have to sort of map the input to the um, to, to like the property changes, so like that that introduces a whole bunch of in between states, and I think like that that is maybe a whole separate discussion on its own. Um, so a couple of things that I'm excited about, as I said, the React ecosystem. There's a bunch of libraries for React. There's something called React Flight that kind of allows you to like have a bunch of states, and then it will automatically tween them. But it's a little hacky, and, and like how it's done. I've, I haven't actually personally tried using it. And then in React Native, they have this thing called um, like animated values, where you will essentially like assign a value to a, to, a, to, a, to a, like you assign this like value variable to a property, and then you change it somewhere else, and that kind of like allows you to nest these structures. Like it's really complicated, and I barely understand it, but it's <laughs> it seems it seems promising. Um, and then I think another um, ecosystem that's very interesting is like the the <coughs> kind of prototyping tools. They're mostly Mac apps for the most part, but like this is also a JavaScript library. Um, that kind of ecosystem has a lot of interesting stuff. This is um, a tool called Framer. That's uh, a JavaScript library that you can use um, to, to sort of prototype interface. It's not actually for production use, but um, they have like this idea of components with states, and they actually do most of that like animation stuff that, that, I, that I talked about where like you can animate between those states. So that's definitely, I think, a very interesting thing to look at. And then finally, I'm very excited um, about GTK4 coming out soonish, maybe end of the year or something, um, which will make animations much easier, from what I understand, which also take it with a grain of salt. Um, and there's a lot of like, really cool work happening there um, about um, sort of redoing the way we do layout with constraints and, and stuff like that. And we've actually been talking about potentially sort of like having graphical tools that allow you to, to, to kind of like have, have these, these nested component structures and edit them in a graphical way, which ultimately is probably what, you, what we want, right? 
probably we want some kind of interface builder that just allows you to visually build these graphs of, of states. Um, so yeah, I mean, as you can see, this is all like very hand wavy and, and like maybe at some point in the future. Um, but I think, yeah, this, this is the direction that, that I feel like is most promising to work in. Uh, but that said, if any of you have any ideas in this direction or like um, are involved with something, you're like, oh yeah, this is a thing that we've already solved. Wait, just a second. That we've already solved. I would love to hear about it and like come talk to me or you know come to IRC and GNOME Design, you know, find me. Um, so yeah, that was a, like a brief look at semantic animation and sort of where I think we are right now in the <laughs> timeline towards the future. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you. And if there's any questions, let me know. All right. That was one there, I think. Yeah, I think that uh, what you described fits very well into the uh, way QML works. Hmm. OK. And I think that <coughs> most of, all of uh, these things are quite easier than web technologies. Uh, OK. Uh, I don't know. That's mostly what I've used, web technologies and QML. And because everything is nested, and everything has, uh, is declarative, and everything has uh, changes when the values change, so you, you can uh, plug the, the um, position of the mouse to the width of the component, so you move the mouse and the weight changes. Mm. And Wait, I, I think I need to repeat the question, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry, go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, don't, I just I guess I need to remember. <laughs> anyway, that's all. Uh, right, so. Mm -hmm. look at it. I think it solves many of these. Okay, so the question or remark was that um, QML, um, or, right? Yeah, QML. Uh, already kind of does a lot of this <laughs> stuff with nested uh, components and like mapped values, if, yeah. if I understood this correctly. And it's declarative. Right, and it's declarative. And yeah, that sounds very interesting. What I would be interested in is like, does it have states? Like, it so, it okay. Exactly what you described. In interesting. <laughs> we should talk more. Um, any more questions, remarks, um, discoveries, as we've just found? Yes. Uh, I do. I haven't used it personally. I mean, I know it, how it works. I don't use it very much, but they have uh, this thing they call drivers. Uh, it's basically that you yes. have UI events, like scroll events, that drive animation. Right. Because um, I've often, start, often started a lot with like the state-based animations, but the UI event uh, different animations I found quite easy to implement and also very useful. For example, like Victor, uh, Victor Design uses them quite a lot for expanding and collapsing matters. So that's like an animation category yeah. that's sort of relatively accessible and easy to implement. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so, okay, so the remark was that principle for the Mac does some of the stuff with, uh, what is it called? Drivers. Yeah, that's what they call it. This right. Is the term they use for it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, like, a lot of these, these sort of experimental Mac, Mac prototyping apps have some really cool <laughs> ideas. Uh, what I would really like to see is, like, those ideas going more to the, like, in, into the base technologies where you just, like, can use it and don't have to... Uh, don't, because then at the end, like what, what I've heard a lot of times is like the designers make these cool sort of prototypes and then the developers like, kill me now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, but thanks. It's really neat, like, because uh, it's very easy to implement usually. Like, you, in our case, we wrote a mix in for Embry yes, and it was like half a day or something. Okay. Really well. Okay, that's great to hear. Uh, there was another question there. Uh, so the question is, do I think that animation improves productivity in graphical user interfaces? So um, I think that's maybe the wrong question to ask. That's like asking, does color improve productivity in user interfaces? You can. You, it's another variable that you use to design with. Like, you can use it in ways that might impact productivity, but like that's a very sort of difficult thing to measure in the first place, right? Uh, like, does you know, if we use more like I don't know, color or contrast in our icons, is that going to improve the productivity? Maybe, but it's something that we can use and that we sort of have the, the, the academic sort of proof, for lack of a better word, that like humans can sort of be, be, um, be taught about things with. And, and that can be useful for anything. I, I think also, yeah, in general, like any kind of productivity applications. Yes? Um, the idea we talked about in some teams I've worked on is uh, the idea that... Um, I don't know if you agree with this, but the animations can help teach a user, but um, perhaps considering um, 
whether as the user learns, the <laughs> software also learns that the user has learned and maybe um, increases efficiency right. by phasing out some of the animations or speeding them up. Uh, what do you think of that idea? So the quest or like the remark was that um, uh, um, there, there's sort of the idea of um, like animations being something that you use to teach people, and then maybe later they're more in your way, if I'm understanding correctly, rather than, than helping. And I think that's definitely a fair point. Um, I think for the most part, like that's what I sort of alluded to before. If it's something in the onboarding process that you only see once, it can be slow. It doesn't really matter. If it's something that you see every day, it should be like 200 milliseconds, and that's it. I think like at that point, like if they're not faster than sort of like the, the really sort of the, the limit of perception, I think it, there's not really a huge gain that you can get by like shaving off maybe 20 more because humans can't really react in that time I, anyway, right? So um, at, at that point, I'm, I'm not sure. Like maybe you could speed them up a little bit, but I think that's a larger sort of discussion about should we change interfaces as your users learn them? I think there's also like sort of, that's another point of contention that <laughs> I think it's maybe separate from this discussion entirely. You have one moment and someone here wanted to ask a question, maybe. I have a last question. question. Last question. Most uh, designers use uh, Mac OS. They have no, 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 all the they, they use there. Sorry? Most of the designers or most of the designers use uh, Adobe software on Mac OS. Sure. If you are on Linux, what do you use to prototype as soon as, uh, as possible so, Instead of uh, uh -huh, right. implementation. Yeah. So the question was like, uh, yeah, we just talked about um, Mac OS prototyping tools. What do we have on GNU Linux? I'm sorry to say nothing. I mean, there's JavaScript libraries, and that's what I do. Um, I, I just like basically figure out the thing on paper and in Inkscape, and then write a little bit of very bad and hacky code. Um, it's not very efficient. And I'm sure it could be better like, if, if I had any graphical tools. But if anyone's interested in working some on, on tools for that, I would be interested to talk. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, uh, suggestion. Figma, it's not open source, sadly, but at least it's open source platform, and it's a lot better than Adobe. Uh, yes, the suggestion was using Figma, which personally, as somebody who cares about software freedom, cannot endorse. I'm sorry. OK, we have, uh, we have to finish now. We have three minutes and 